It was a typical Friday, Saturday night for me during my college years. Typical in that we always found parties. However, this party was being thrown by Ken Kesey's son. Ken, the famed writer, counterculture icon, and some call the father of the hippies. Although he was not actually a hippie, he was in between the beatniks, who came before, and the hippies, who came after. I had hoped I might get to speak with him. A couple of hours into the party, my wish came true. He was making the rounds. He recognized me from my days as a baseball player. He greeted me and asked if I would have a beer with him. Found him to be very down to earth, sincere, empathetic, and despite his fame, very humble. His hospitality was very warm. We didn't chat about his writings, his crazy merry prankster days, about his novels, or about all his famous friends, but rather just a general conversation. He listened intensely, with seemingly great interest as I spoke. I could easily see why he was known to be one of the most charismatic figures of the 20th century. I saw the tremendous charm he had with so many actors, bands, musicians, artists, and countless others spoke of. Our conversation was next to the bus further, known as the Magic Bus, and the most famous relic of the wild 1960s. I will do a part two to this video, and will speak more on further. Kesey grew up just east of the city of Eugene in the Pacific Northwest. He played football and wrestled at the University of Oregon in the mid to late 1950s, then received the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship. He used this to attend graduate school at Stanford University and studied writing. In 1959, while a graduate student, Kesey volunteered for the CIA experiments of LSD. So did beatnik Allen Ginsberg and Robert Hunter of the Grateful Dead. From 1953 to 1973, the CIA did these trials for their potential use in interrogation, brainwashing, and psychological torture. The project was called MK Ultra. They experimented with LSD, cocaine, methamphetamines, mescaline, and marijuana. In 1960, Ken nearly made the U.S. Olympic team in wrestling. We are told by society how we should live, how we should spend our time, what we should think, and what we should be. There's a harsh judgment if we don't follow this. This judgment was quite a bit stronger in the past, but still exists. Kesey, like the beatniks and other bohemian groups before and after him, rebelled against this. The thinking was we should live as we want. We should be free to be ourselves, to explore our own creativity and see where it takes us. What I believe was different about Kesey was his positivity. Many of the bohemian movements before him contained a strong hopelessness. It seems to me Kesey believed in the human spirit, community, and our potential. He is often cited as one of the most important American authors of the 20th century. His common writing themes are of reality, the human spirit, and individuality. His novel, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, is narrated by the character Chief Bromden, who has faked his deafness and inability to speak. The setting is a psychiatric hospital. Actor Jack Nicholson, in the film version, plays the lead as Randall Patrick McMurphy, who has faked his insanity to get out of a jail sentence for battery and gambling. Nurse Ratchet overlooks the ward with a strong authoritarian rule. Randall is constantly trying to antagonize and undermine her rule. Eventually, she gets even having him lobotomized, and he falls into a coma. I cannot help but wonder if Kesey was making comparisons to how our society in general is ran. The film version 
won the Academy Award for Best Picture in 1975. Was Kesey making a comparison between the Assane Asylum and modern society? The novel Sometimes a Great Notion is what Kesey believes was his masterpiece. It is about the logging industry based on the Oregon coast. The workers for a local lumber mill are striking. The Stamper family are independent loggers who refuse to give in to the strike. This upsets the local community. In the film version, actors Henry Fonda and Paul Newman play the lead characters of the Stamper family. Ken's residence, while attending graduate school, was on Perry Lane, just west of Stanford University. There, he would offer LSD to friends at his parties. LSD was legal then. This was a bohemian neighborhood where smoking marijuana several times a day was common. He would frequently visit beatnik communities of North Beach, the northern part of San Francisco. The beatniks I have covered in two recent videos. They were typically a literary movement that was anti-establishment. They didn't agree with American values of materialism, greed, and felt confined by societal judgments. Ken was greatly influenced by the beatniks. A group of very close friends would accompany him through his counterculture escapades and would become known as the Merry Pranksters. I'll do another video on them. The Merry Pranksters were an exceptional group of creatives, including writers, artists, and others. His parties would grow to 24 hours a day and would feature the Grateful Dead band playing. Ken was good friends with Jerry Garcia, the lead singer of the Grateful Dead, until Jerry's death in 1995. There would also be drug-induced poetry readings. In 1963, from the proceeds of his writings, he bought a 10-acre home six miles to the west of Stamford in the towering redwood forest of the coastal mountain range, a place called La Honda. I suppose the hippie idea of the commune came from this, as there was an open-door policy to staying there. Many of the merry pranksters made this their home. The parties there became legendary, and I can't say I've heard of anything like them. It was said there were no rules, fear didn't exist, and nor did anyone sleep in La Honda. Each week the parties became more and more intense. Writer Hunter S. Thompson, maybe best known for his novel Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which was made into a film starring Johnny Depp, said that somehow the best minds of their generation came together at Kesey's La Honda Place. Late in 1963, Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest premiered on Broadway. Kesey drove back to see it. While there, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and this left Kesey to question many things. Kesey made a trip to New York in 1964 for the publishing of his novel, Sometimes a Great Notion. A core group of 14 would accompany him. The number would sometimes reach between 20 and 40. He purchased a school bus for the trip, and this became known as the Magic Bus or Further. The trip was portrayed in the book The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by Tom Wolfe in 1968 and the film The Magic Trip in 2011. When Ken and the Merry Pranksters returned to La Honda, they would add film viewing of their trip to New York and back. They would do this often, and it brought in quite a number of people. Of course, all done while consuming LSD. Ken and the Merry Pranksters then stepped up the level of their parties and called them the Acid Test. The Acid Test would be costume parties and it was encouraged that the attendees bring along musical instruments and play along with the Grateful Dead. Even the Hell's Angels would show up to his house. This was a who's who of the creative and entertainment industries. It included writers like Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, Hunter S. Thompson, 
Truman Capote, and Charles Bukowski. Bands like the Rolling Stones, the Doors, the Mamas and the Papas, Jefferson Airplane, singers Bob Dylan, Janis Joplin, and Jimi Hendrix. Actors Dennis Hopper, Jack Nicholson, Marlon Brando, Natalie Wood, Gene Hackman, Warren Beatty, Peter Fonda, Jane Fonda, Steve McQueen, and others. The acid tests were multiple day parties. Artist Andy Warhol attended one of these and said, it was one of the most exciting things he'd ever seen. That it was like watching a whole new world opening up. Keezy and the Merry Pranksters would take these public and would travel between Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Portland, handing out the legal LSD. One of these was the Trips Festival in January of 1966. 10,000 people attended the festival to drink punch with LSD in it. The culture of Haight-Ashbury changed in the couple of months after the Trips Festival, creating the movement that would make for the summer of love there the following year. This then is when the hippie culture really developed. They would share everything. They viewed one another as if they were all related. In 1965, Kesey was arrested for smoking marijuana. He faked his death, then fled for eight months to Mexico. Shortly after returning to San Francisco, on January 17, 1966, he was found by the FBI agents. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover sent a congratulations letter to the FBI agents who found him. Kesey served six months in prison and upon release would move back to Eugene, Oregon, or rather a few miles to the east. He purchased a farm and raised cattle. He would then miss the forming of the hippies in San Francisco. Many of the merry pranksters and future hippies would follow him to Eugene, which is a big part of why Eugene became a hippie enclave. His Eugene house was a commune of sorts in that people would come there to write, create art, produce music, or explore the bounds of consciousness. Singer David Bowie visited and stayed, saying it was one of the most memorable experiences of his life. Many other bands, singers, writers, actors, and other celebrity creatives visited Kesey and Eugene. Please subscribe and like, as that is how YouTube decides to send it on to others. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day, and see you in the next episode.